I want to start by telling you two quick stories of two artifacts that will hopefully uh, get you thinking about how we uh, create things that we use. The first is a bridge in the mountains in a remote area of Peru. This is very far away from any major city. But this bridge has been there for 700 years, and it's been maintained by two villages on either side of a deep canyon. They come together every single year, and they renew this bridge entirely. They rebuild it completely from strands of grass that grow on the hillside on either side, only a couple feet long. So this is a, a living, growing bridge. Well, after they cut it, it's no longer living. I hope, Maria, well, we'll have to argue about that later. Um, and, uh, and it's survived like this for over 600 years. In fact, a new bridge was built upstream 40 years ago. This bridge was no longer needed, but the social festival that rebuilds it every year required them, or they came together and produced it. This bridge is made of local materials. It's biodegradable. It's renewable. It's maybe even carbon negative. Uh, now let's compare that to another artifact. You're all feeling pretty tired, so I'm going to offer you a refreshment. This is the story of a can of Coca-Cola and what it takes to make that can. We can do a material flow analysis, tracing the materials. We begin by, in Australia, mining a bauxite, uh, reducing that to aluminum oxide. It's transported by ore carrier to Sweden, Norway. It's smelted down to pure aluminum. It arrives in Sweden, Germany by ship, or Germany by ship. It's then trucked, heated rolled to 900 degrees. Cold rolled, trucked again. It arrives in England, where it magically turns into aluminum and then it's uh, punched and uh, formed into cans. It's washed, dried, painted twice. It's finally filled with this uh, elixir and uh, it comes from uh, water, from sugar made of beets. Uh, those are harvested in France, milled, refined, it's shipped, it's trucked, it's made from phosphorus from the country of Idaho. Uh, it has to be excavated from mines, uh, shipped again. Finally, the can is sealed, it's wrapped in cardboard, that has to be colored. The, the paper could come from Sweden, Siberia, British Columbia, a palletized truck. It arrives at the supermarket after this odyssey, purchased within three days, drinking it takes a few minutes, throwing it away takes a second, and we throw away enough aluminum in the United States every three months to replace our entire commercial aircraft fleet. So this is a, a kind of 19th century pattern of consumption. Uh, if we look at where that's leading us, our energy consumption is going up and up. Buildings are consuming more than any other sector. Uh, Cambridge has just released a marvelous new tool, thank you, Mayor, together with my colleague Christoph Reinhardt. Uh, you can type in an address, see the solar potential. One of the brightest spots in all of Cambridge is this roof over your heads, uh, which would give a tremendous return on investment, a, a seven-year payback period, about a 14% return. And maybe we can get Harvard to invest in it. And, um, and uh, really, there's a lot of potential, but it's not enough. If we covered the Hancock Tower with solar panels, with photovoltaics, it would generate only about 20% of the energy needed to power that tower. So we really have to look not just at the supply side, where the energy comes from, but at the demand side. And this is a complex graph that on the vertical axis plots the uh, cost of saving carbon or in the uh, savings potentially if it's negative, horizontally the different technologies. Many of the technologies that we're so excited about will save energy, will cut carbon, but they're very expensive. The way toward uh, better cities, lower energy cities, a lower carbon economy is through a combination of things, but especially ones that pay us back have a lot to do with efficiency of building. And there have been exercises to plan envision cities of the future in uh, major exhibitions around the world in London and New York. We should do something like that for Boston to try to ask ourselves, where do we want to go? But in general, a guiding principle is maximize the use of local resources, uh, try to make uh, cities more livable, more walkable, lower our emissions through greater efficiency in our building. Cities are generally fairly low carbon uh, and low energy consumption compared to other uh, means of, of uh, or living in more rural areas with uh, spread farther apart. So there are inherent efficiencies in cities, but we could do much better. And I close with the concept of a building that's kind of like the Inca Bridge, a project we recently did in South Africa, which is made of almost entirely local materials built from the soil on the site uh, and has dramatically lower carbon. Uh, so there's a great promise there. Thank you very much. Thank you.
So from Coke cans to the roof over our heads uh, in five minutes, uh, what attitudes do you see to these kinds of ideas in the construction industry today? The growth of more sustainable buildings and uh, lower energy cities has been absolutely dramatic. And I've been at MIT for 10 years, and when I first arrived in my teaching, I tried to get what I thought would be way ahead of the curve, and I was just overwhelmed by a tidal wave. I mean, it's just been absolutely incredible, the growth. Uh, the recent downturn in the economy has slowed that somewhat, but it, some people predicted it, it would go away as a bit of a fad, but it's, it's here to stay. It's part of how we do business now, and there are inherent benefits to uh, lower energy cities and buildings, and so uh, that is inherently how we think about designing buildings now, which is good. So you think it's, there's a wave beginning to happen through, through the construction sector? Well, the growth in the last decade has been absolutely exponential, and um, in terms of an emphasis on sustainable building, and it doesn't look to be slowing, basically, which is great. Thank you. Over here, please. So some of these have become mainstream and are adopted by builders. The more extreme examples, like you showed in South Africa, are much more difficult. Who are the owners and developers and builders who can actually go to those latest technologies, the furthest along, and push it so that the wave can follow them? That's a fascinating question. But some of the greenest buildings in this country that have been built in the last five years are business schools at universities all over the country. And that tells you something. Um, and sadly, um, there are many engineering buildings that are quite inefficient, and architecture buildings are just about the worst in terms of efficiency. <laughs> and, uh, and that's unfortunate. But the fact that the business schools get it, that you get better environments, uh, greater health of occupants, that that's a return in terms of productivity, um, that uh, there are just a whole series of benefits, that's very encouraging and promising. So I can give you more examples, but. Uh, but business schools is a pretty good one. Please. So you mentioned that we, are, we should be moving towards this low energy cities. And the picture you showed about London predicted by 2050, we could probably try to make London more low energy and not as wasteful in energy as it is right now. But how would, how would we be, be able to incentivize this right now? And how close are we to lower energy cities? One of the first important ideas is to measure where we are currently. And we can't make improvements until we know where we are. So I think over the last five years, we've seen a dramatic growth in terms of benchmarking carbon emissions for individuals, for corporations, for universities, for cities. And so I would say that measuring, managing, reducing carbon emissions uh, will be the norm, but it's already becoming the norm in many places. And I'm actually very proud of Harvard University for documenting their emissions, uh, showing reductions, and showing targets for where they'd like to be. And uh, so I think they've been a model for really doing that. So. You just heard an MIT person congratulating Harvard. We'll move swiftly on. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that I was going to ask you the question about uh, the next policy that this city is uh, planning to adopt, which is building energy disclosure. And I think you were just saying benchmarking uh, the idea that you would be uh, looking at the existing conditions is very important. But one thing you might answer that might uh, be helpful is uh, the rate of change in new buildings compared to the rate of change in existing buildings and how to think about that. Because in new buildings and all the new buildings that we're building here in Cambridge, uh, we have uh, the large buildings particularly, we're going to have very stringent standards for those new buildings. But existing buildings are are not changing as fast. So how do you think about that and the rate of change and the rate of pulling down uh, total emissions over time? Yeah, I think in general, that's a wonderful question. And, and thank you, Mayor, for being here and for all the good work you're doing here in Cambridge. Um, it's, um, I think in general, we are focusing in a, in sufficiently on new buildings, but insufficiently on existing buildings. So much of our building stock is already built. Much of our building stock in 2040 is already built. So we do need to pay careful attention at improving that. And one of the things we're studying quite carefully at MIT is trying to understand when it makes sense to improve what you have versus starting over. And obviously, in the case of historically significant places, we don't want to start over. But, um, but in general, I think uh, there are tremendous returns economically, environmentally, to 
focus on existing buildings, and I don't think we've quite been doing enough. So thank you for drawing that distinction. Thank you very much. Thank you.